older now, so I'm not sure I remember anything. But uh, older and wiser, you know. <laughs> no, definitely not wiser. <laughs> So I will do the Zoom for you. You just tell me when to move on. And um, okay. I want to welcome, as I say, Dr. Mark Meyer, who's going to give us a whirlwind tour of 10 significant events, which took place from between the fifth and 17th centuries in Ireland that provide a framework really for the, the growth of what becomes uh, modern Ireland. These top 10 events illustrate the trials and travails of the Irish during this thousand year period. So covering a lot in an hour. Um, each year we'll focus on a particular event. And of course we'll cover the highlights like um, Patrick's mission, but also the siege of Drogheda. And so this is basically everything you wanted to ask about early modern Ireland, but we're afraid to ask. And so uh, I will share my screen and um, we'll get cracking with the presentation. Just give me another one second to set this up uh lord okay and then i'm going to put you mark as the only speaker yeah perfect so take it away thank you so much dr meyer we're delighted to have you thank you um i really appreciate the opportunity to uh to speak with all of you tonight and i probably haven't been um haven't been with so many irish men and women since 1975 <laughs> when I was in Dublin, uh, doing a couple of degrees at University College in Belfield. Um, Yay, me too. <laughs> Not in those years, though. <laughs> what, what do you mean exactly, Elizabeth? Well, you know, I'm just <laughs> chronologically. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I mean, as I was thinking about uh, this talk a year or so ago, I thought uh, I'd talk about how the Irish saved civilization. But then I discovered that a guy already wrote a book on that. <laughs> so um, I decided to do something a little bit different. Um, and as I was uh, more than sipping some writer's tears, some of you may know that drink, um, thanks to a lovely gift bottle from my friend Fiona Smith, I decided to uh, take a slightly different tack on this and settled on the theme of how the Irish survived civilization mm. and uh, at least survived a very invasive and predatory form of civilization, much like we see at the end of the 19th century among European powers um, with the rest of the world. But in, uh, in, in, in this, um, I came to understand that the Irish did in fact survive um, by holding on to what we might generally construe as the essence of being Irish and transforming and influencing along the way the people with whom they came into contact. Um, the Irish didn't take a short view on this, mainly because they didn't have that luxury and this lasted for centuries and centuries. Um, they stuck it out through the hardships and the prejudices, the persecutions, uh, all with incredible resilience, I think, buried deep in the Irish DNA. So um, I think we can trace this certainly back beyond the Middle Ages, but certainly we see it in the early medieval period when Irish peregrini or those spiritual wanderers spread the Irish life force and advanced the culture of Christendom from their own Atlantic shores to those uh, Mediterranean coastlines of Italy and Greece and even beyond. It's quite a remarkable story to be sure. And so what I eventually settled on was uh, because lists are fun to make, I decided to get a list of important dates or more specifically important events that kind of provide a 60 second gourmet approach to the expanse and depth of Irish history. There's a lot that I left out and I'm sure that if you and maybe you'll do this after I'm through here, um, kind of set yourself the task of, of creating your own lists, then um, 
you know, it might be a kind of an interesting educational uh, and fun exercise. Um, but doing this kind of provides, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, a kind of roadmap to the landscape of contemporary Ireland. And um, the, the first question that I had to answer was really, um, so for Ireland, what uh, is the medieval period? And I recall having a discussion about this with uh, a renowned scholar in the field, um, Dr. Terry Dolan. And uh, Dr. Dolan suggested that the Middle Ages ended in Ireland in 1921. And there's something to be said for that, I think. But um, I'm going to privilege 1649 uh, tonight when the activity of our all of I'm sure all of our favorite historical person, Oliver Cromwell, uh, changed the course of Irish history rather dramatically for a number of centuries. Um, so before I actually start in on these dates, um, I have two caveats uh, to issue here. One is that it's been probably 25 years or so since I've taught Irish history. So uh, hopefully I kind of remember what, what I used to do um, before I got into schooling. And um, this is also tempered by just, you know, old age. Um, uh, things come and go as uh, maybe some of you have experienced too. Um, and also uh, in the background, um, I'm in my study at the moment and uh, behind me there's a day bed and you might see a dog bounce up and down on that bed. So hopefully that won't distract anybody. Um, at any rate, um, just let's plunge right into this. I think probably that 90% of you would probably click off if I didn't begin with Patrick. Um, and there's good reason for that, because Patrick uh, really is the foundation of Irish history in the, in the true sense of the word history. And I'm, I'm not suggesting Irish prehistory isn't important, but it's Patrick who authored the earliest extant written documents for Ireland. Um, and certainly to some form of Christianity probably arrived prior to Patrick's arrival um, in uh, about 435, uh, probably through trade from Roman Britain and Gaul and so on. But we do learn from uh, Patrick's confessions that he was British by birth, uh, was captured and enslaved by Irish raiders and eventually escaped and returned to Britain where either there or in Gaul, um, he was trained as a priest. Um, he returned to Ireland because of, as he says, a vision he had years earlier. And he kind of established himself at Armagh. And Patrick began to organize the Irish church along Roman lines by diocese, uh, primarily in the north. And this kind of held for a while, but ultimately, uh, as I'll mention later, the monastery um, really was the organizational tool of the Irish church in the early Middle Ages, at least. Um, and uh, none of this was easy, of course. And we learn from a near contemporary prayer known as St. Patrick's Breastplate um, that Patrick uh, so, uh, purportedly cited this hymn when the King of Tara tried to ambush him so he wouldn't spread Christianity into, into the area of Tara. Uh, so the story goes that the King's men only saw Patrick and his monks as wild deer, as an apparition of sorts. And um, we might kind of discount the veracity of that transformation, but not the beauty of the hymn and its spiritual meaning. Um, and I'm going to read just one short verse from, from this work. 
I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of sun, brilliance of moon, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depth of sea, stability of earth, firmness of rock. Uh, one short stanza and uh, scholars believe that this was in fact written by Patrick himself. Well, he certainly was a man of, of aesthetic inclinations and Patrick encouraged the practice of self-denial and devout spirituality as kind of befitted his monkish countenance. And before the end of the uh, fifth century, Patrick's successor at Armagh, Cormac, uh, who was also styled the first abbot. Um, indeed, uh, we can see even in this short period of time, the early medieval Irish church would ultimately revolve around monasteries and powerful abbots. Um, and this would take precedence over any kind of hierarchical diocesan structure um, that certainly Patrick wanted to, uh, to instill in Ireland. And whether we look at legend or history, um, certainly St. Patrick has had a great impact on Irish culture in many different ways. And I think that the real Patrick, which we find uh, in documents and so on um, is much more interesting than the Patrick of legend. Um, we all know, of course, and believe that he expelled the snakes from Ireland. Um, he explained the Trinity by pointing to a shamrock and converted absolutely every man, woman, and child in Ireland in the course of 30 years. Um, but the real Patrick, uh, his life experiences, uh, at least from the documentation we had, show him to be a man who trusted God completely. And this was perhaps um, one of his greatest legacies beyond um, propagating the faith uh, in the fifth century. So Elizabeth, slide please. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with St. Columba, but he too is kind of a monument um, of early Irish monasticism. And certainly the growth of monasticism, uh, as I've implied, had a tremendous impact on Irish culture and society. And being a monk or a nun, of course, meant living a communal life uh, for the sake of God through very rigorous discipline uh, and for the purpose of the salvation of the individual soul. And from the mid fifth century, monasteries were popping up all over Ireland. And uh, the monastics found strength and faith and this practice of strict self-denial, which at the time seemed to be well suited to the Irish temperament. Well, the first monasteries were usually, not always, but usually located in isolated places like Glendalough and the Wicklows or on islands like Skelligoff Kerry. And some of these monasteries were built by important forts of kings and chieftains as well. And literally hundreds of monasteries were founded during the Middle Ages. I mean, you can't walk a block and a half without some remain of a monastery uh, even today. They were all over the place and lots of them. And Patrick, of course, founded a lot of monasteries and the trend continued after his death as well. And uh, interestingly, one monastic house usually gave birth to others. Uh, so there were mother houses and daughter houses. And uh, during the late fifth and sixth centuries, for example, St. Ninian's Monastery at Whithorn and Galway was really a spiritual training ground for a lot of future saints of the Irish church. Um, and uh, St. Finian's as well. Uh, his monastery at Clonard 
uh, fostered uh, a, a very scholarly approach to monastic life, so much so that Finian came to be known as the teacher of the saints of Ireland. And that is a tradition that continues and in a very important one too about Irish scholarship, as we'll see. Perhaps the best known Clonard alumnus is Columba, uh, or as he is sometimes called by purist Colum Keel. Um, he combines scholarship with that love of wandering, so characteristic of Irish monks. And these Irish peregrini, again, these spiritual wanderers can be found in every part of Christendom during the early Middle Ages. I mean, they are all over the place. And even a partial list of Irish foundations beyond Ireland uh, reads like a kind of what, what uh, list of monasteries. Lindisfarne, Iona, uh, Lucille, Bobbio, Sangal, these are major institutions. Um, and um, the work that, had, that was done in, in these monasteries was absolutely incredible. And as for Columba himself, he was born in Donegal, uh, was related uh, to the house of O'Neill. And uh, prior to leaving Ireland for Britain, um, he had already founded monasteries in Derry and Duro and Kells, which is a pretty remarkable achievement in itself. Um, yet he wasn't finished. And in 563, Columba left Ireland with just by chance, 12 companions and ended up on the west coast of Britain, northern Britain. And there he was asked by a local ruler to found a monastery at Iona, which is off the northwest coast of Scotland. It's an island. And what we know of Columba comes mostly from his saint's life which became one of the most influential hagiographical works of the early Middle Ages. It was one of those things that served as a model for all saints' lives, pretty much. And in it, uh, Columba um, emerges as a very charismatic figure, tall and powerful and a great scholar and poet um, and uh, characterized by a fearlessness to uh, and desire to do God's work. And the life has a ton of prophecies and miracles, and saints' lives all have those. Um, and it's closely modeled on the Gospels as well, in terms of its structure, um, as all good saints' lives are. Um, and uh, one story uh, about uh, Columba and Iona um, is kind of interesting. And I'll uh, quote from that. On a certain day in the same summer in which he passed to the Lord, the saint went in a chariot to visit some of the brethren who were engaged in some heavy work in the Western part of Iona. After speaking to them some words of comfort and encouragement, the saint stood upon the higher ground and uttered the following prophecy. My dear children, I know that from this day you shall never see my face again. Seeing the brethren filled with sorrow upon hearing these words, the saint tried to comfort them as best he could. And raising both his holy hands, he blessed the whole of this island saying, from this very moment, Poisonous reptile shall in no way be able to hurt men or cattle in this island, so long as the inhabitants shall continue to observe the commandments of Christ. Well, there's another snake story, um, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, but through the monasteries that uh, he founded, Columba established a, a kind of divinely ordained order in the world. Uh, these were beacons of light that lit up a dark and chaotic world. And as abbot, uh, he controlled his monasteries, including Iona, 
and the traditions he established in Northern Britain were upheld by his spiritual followers for about a century after his death in 597. Um, they were tenacious, they were devout and totally devoted to Celtic Christianity, which was different than that of Rome in many respects. Uh, and they were also uh, very much into venerating Columba himself, now a saint. And this put the Irish monks and missionaries on a direct path of conflict with Roman Christianity. Which brings us to 664 and the Synod of Whitby. This is not a well-known event, but a very important one because ultimately what happens here at the Synod of Whitby is that at least for England and Southern Scotland, Celtic Christianity is pretty much stopped in its tracks. Now the conflict between the two had kind of a monumental impact on hence the Irish and Anglo-Saxon churches. And what played out in Whitby was both political and religious. At stake were the unification of the great kingdom of Northumbria and the organization of the church and some of its uh, core beliefs. And one of those beliefs was the dating of Easter. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. But certainly the defeat of the Irish contingent to the Synod led by Abbot Coleman um, and a defeat engineered by um, Bishop Wilfred of Hexham and King Oswy of Northumbria was a definite victory for the Roman church. Coleman and the monks of Lindisfarne, which uh, was a kind of ski on house of Columba's monastery at Iona uh, were basically forced to leave the area and kind of ply their spiritual wares elsewhere. Well, as for Coleman himself, he came from the west of Ireland, uh, became the abbot of the great monastery of Lindisfarne in 661. And little did he realize at that point in time that he was walking into a real hornet's nest of a clash of culture. Again, especially over this calculation of the date of Easter. Now the proper date of the celebration of this most important Christian feast had already divided uh, the Northumbrian royal court. The queen and her followers observed Easter on a different day than did the king, which means that one royal faction was celebrating Easter while the other one was still fasting during Lent. And this was a situation that uh, couldn't be tolerated. So a synod was held to kind of fix this problem and a couple of others. And it was held at Whitby, which was a monastery, a, a so-called double monastery where both monks and nuns lived under the strict rule of Hild, who was a powerful Northumbrian noblewoman and an adherent of the uh, Irish Easter calculation. So Bishop Wilfred recently kicked out a bunch of Irish monks from a monastery that he kind of gained control over at Ripon. And uh, because he had pretty good credentials um, as a churchman, however ambitious he was, um, he was selected as the main advocate for the Roman view. So he argued that his method of calculating Easter was used in Rome and sanctioned by the bishops of Rome who derived their authority, as we know popes do, from Christ through St. Peter. So the Roman Easter, he claimed, was divinely ordained by Christ himself. And then King Oswy uh, stepped in and asked both sides, Irish and Anglo-Saxon, 
if the apostle Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven by Christ. And both sides agreed. So Oswe then declared in favor of the holder of the keys, meaning that the Roman right prevailed. So why does any of that matter? Whatever circumstances, for example, St. Patrick's Day occurs on the same day every year. Uh, in contrast, Easter is a movable feast. It springs back and forth in an apparently chaotic manner, which isn't actually true, but it appears that way. And the date on which the resurrection is celebrated is determined by a very careful calculation that fixes the date in accordance with the movement and motions of the sun and the moon. And since the, the resurrection is a triumph um, symbolically of light over darkness, that's an important thing. So the movements of the sun and the moon, and hence the divine order, determined the course of all life and salvation and governed the liturgical year. So an accurate reckoning of Easter in particular is a matter no less than the salvation of humanity and maintaining God's order in the universe. And these are not insignificant concerns. So that was a big deal trying to figure this out and get everybody on the same page. Well, Coleman, and his Ionian missionaries might have lost out ultimately in the Easter controversy, but their engagements with the rather naughty problems of Easter calculation demonstrate something really important. How advanced these folks were for their time in the field of mathematics and time reckoning, uh, not to mention other scholarly pursuits. And this is where we find this tradition of scholarship second to none in all of Christendom that was propagated in Ireland and in the monasteries and the monasteries they founded. But scholarship wasn't the only thing that, um, that the Irish monks were into. Hence the Book of Kells. If I could see all of you, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you've ever seen this at Trinity College. Um, but uh, it's something not to be missed for sure. And most medieval manuscripts like the Book of Kells, um, go back one. Nope. You go on the right, that's it. Okay, that was a little preview of something else, but um, but most medieval uh, illuminated manuscripts were made in monasteries and monks and nuns not only copied text, uh, but they also illuminated or illustrated the manuscripts as a way of making the words and uh, symbols and images come alive. And that wasn't a bad thing in an era when most people were illiterate, at least these folks could look at the pictures and they were instructive. But most medieval manuscripts, uh, illuminated or not, were written on parchment, mostly, most commonly uh, cow, sheep, or goat skin. But those manuscripts like Kells that were really important were, and to be illuminated um, were written on the best quality of parchment called vellum, which is calf skin. And it's estimated that uh, over 50 calves sacrificed their lives to have this book made. Um, and my favorite page is what you're looking at there. I trust you can all see the slide. Yeah. Um, so that is called the Key Row Carpet Page. And it is an incredible work of art. And to my mind, it's equivalent uh, 
in terms of artistic achievement as the Sistine Chapel, for example. Maybe not as large or as grand, but an amazing piece of artwork. Um, and it was, uh, the, the book itself, Kells, was created by four primary calligraphers and artists in around 800. Um, and uh, it has the four gospels uh, based on the Vulgate text, uh, which was uh, done by Jerome in the end of the fourth century and uh, has a couple of other little things in it too, like canon tables and concordances and so on. Um, and it's written in um, a very wonderful script called Insular Magiscule. And it's four, uh, 340 folios big. And the most notable one is 34. Uh, which is what you're looking at there, the key row page. And what this page does, it introduces um, Matthew's account of the nativity and is the single most, I think it's fair to say, famous folio in medieval art. Um, and these were probably created um, like other major pages of this manuscript on single sheets. Uh, and um, they were then attached together. Some are missing. Um, about 30 folios went missing over the, over the centuries. Um, for example, uh, we have no portraits of Mark and Luke, but we do have Matthew and John. And so it only makes common sense uh, to kind of figure that all the apostles were, uh, were represented. And for those of you who um, see it or have seen it, um, and it pains me to say this being a UCD guy, but um, it's in Trinity College. Um, but there's a good reason for that because uh, our friend uh, Oliver Cromwell, when he was um, stirring up all sorts of trouble uh, in the 1650s, um, it eventually went to Trinity uh, for safekeeping. Um, so luckily, you know, it's, uh, it's still with us. And because of its importance, uh, to the Middle Ages, uh, which is very much a part of many school curricula. Um, I use it for one of uh, the projects in the humanities course at St. Gregory's School uh, down the road from probably everybody here. But um, slide. So this is another page. This is uh, from Luke, The Temptation of Christ. And in this project I, I do with students, they select one of the pages from Kells and reproduce it using, um, using tools and techniques that would have been used by the manuscript illuminators. Now, the, the, the materials are a little bit different. Um, we don't make our own paint, you know. Um, the gold leaf isn't really gold leaf, but uh, it's a close facsimile. And ultimately what results is, um, and this will fade in and out now. So go ahead and see if there. And that is that page, Folio 202, uh, which was done by one of our students, uh, Curious. Kira Smith. And I think that's just a wonderful piece of work. Takes about a month, not straight through, uh, but about a month um, to ultimately finish, uh, finish these, these productions. I think it's just really great. Um, and uh, teaches kids a lot about Irish culture and so on. So it's great. Um, so from scholarship to artistic creativity and back to 
Yep, we'll go on to uh, Dun Scott, uh, uh, Scotus Regina now, and the Palace School. Now, uh, if you're at all familiar with uh, Regina, um, I got to hand it to you. I mean, I've read some of his stuff, and I absolutely don't really understand it. And nobody else does, I know, either. Um, but what that speaks to is the incredible intellect behind his work and what an incredible scholar Eregina was. So even though the Irish monks experienced a setback at, at Whitby and, and the council at Whitby, it didn't diminish the spread of Irish scholarship, nor did it diminish or decrease their exuberance for traveling around outside of Ireland, in Ireland, everywhere. And at least for, uh, or from the, uh, the late sixth century, uh, Irish monastic schools tended to focus on biblical exegesis, uh, interpreting the Bible, Latin, and even Irish grammar and rhetoric. And they gave attention to, when they could, uh, the classics of Greece and Rome, those classics of antiquity. And the ability of the Irish monks to grasp such a wide range of ideas and concepts and then actually make something of them suggests a truly profound level of scholarly work inside the monasteries. And as a result, um, Irish scholars caught the attention of notable Anglo-Saxon kings uh, throughout Britain and Southern Scotland and the Carolingian kings. And Eregina is a standout in this regard. Um, born in Ireland and educated in monastic schools there. And then he made a brief trip to Athens where he learned Greek. And it is said, I don't, I think this is apocryphal, but uh, supposedly Eregina was the only person in Europe who knew how to read Greek. Um, that's probably not true, but he did know how to read Greek. Um, at any rate, by uh, 845, um, he was found teaching at the palace school of Charles the Bald, who was the grandson of Charlemagne. This was the grandest royal court, imperial court in Europe at the time. So known as the Irishman, um, he was a spectacular scholar. And he is generally recognized as the most original thinker of the period from Boethius in the sixth century to Anselm in the 12th century. So towering was this guy. And if you can imagine kind of walking through a forest and all of a sudden coming upon the Empire State Building, that Empire State Building is Eregina. I mean, it's that, he's that out of context in terms of his ideas, his learning, uh, his scholarship and his theology. Um, so he's a pretty impressive guy, to be sure. And he develops a very consistent and systematic uh, Christian theology um, based primarily on Christian sources, but also he ha did have access to some classics such as Plato's Timaeus, which was Plato's attempt to create a cosmology uh, within his own philosophical tradition. And uh, Regina learned a lot from that as well. And so within a few years of his arrival in the Carolingian court, Regina began his major work, which is called On the Division of Nature, which is written in the form of a platonic dialogue, interestingly enough. And the work proposes, um, and I'm kind of simplifying this, uh, kind of a threefold essence of nature. The first, that which creates and is not created. 
which he equates with God. That which is created and creates ideas in the mind of God, which is very platonic. And thirdly, that which is created and does not create. In other words, things in the world of time and space that emanate from the mind of God, which of course leads back to God. So there's kind of this circular notion. Um, and in creating this framework, he, uh, he accounts for really the totality of the cosmos and the universe through harmony of being and the power of God, which is really quite interesting. Most of what he writes, uh, as we can tell by other sources, uh, the finer points of his worldview uh, were lost on his contemporaries. I mean, people just simply didn't understand him. Um, but Rage in his life and his scholarly activities show that Irish monastic culture was far from being confined to Ireland or even to Irish monasteries that, that were scattered throughout Christendom. I mean, these guys were everywhere. And what we see with the Regina is the finest example of Irish scholarship. So um, he, left, he left his colleagues uh, in kind of a deep fog, so to speak. And, um, What's interesting is that uh, the frustration that people must have felt when they were around him or reading his work um, gave life to an anecdote about Origena's death that was related by the English historian, a great historian, William of Malmesbury. He records that the Irishman was stabbed to death by the pens of disgruntled students which is a lesson for all teachers, I'm sure. Um, but he is a towering figure, for sure. How's our time? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. We are at, it's 10 to 8, 10 okay. minutes before 8. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, if I don't get through all 10 of these, just let me know when my time's up. We didn't, we didn't set a limit. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. tell you if the audience leave and it's just me and you. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I wanted uh, to say that I was missing earlier on, I was trying to get into the chat. We have a, just a copy, of, well, a reproduction of the Book of Kells on display in the museum at the moment. So, you know, come on down everyone and see it. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, so we're gonna go now to-, to my people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back up one more. I think that's it. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. That's it. Um, so, you know, throughout Christendom during the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, and really into the 11th century, Vikings were all over the place, causing all sorts of havoc and hell. Um, this lesson, to some degree, um, with the Viking conversion to Christianity, but that was a long time in coming. And especially during the late eighth uh, and ninth centuries, uh, as the chroniclers throughout Europe um, reveal that prayers were frequently sent to heaven begging deliverance from these savage Vikings. Um, and Norse warriors launched one of their first recorded attacks in 793 off the coast of Northern England at Lindisfarne. And Alcuin, an Anglo-Saxon scholar who was friends with Charlemagne himself, wrote, never before has such terror appeared in Britain as we have now suffered from a pagan race, nor was it thought possible that such an inroad from the sea could be made. Behold the church of St. Cuthbert at Lindisfarne, spattered with the blood of the priests of God and despoiled of all its ornaments. It is given as prey to pagan peoples. Well, within a very 
short period of time, Viking raids were launched with increasing frequency and severity. And uh, in fact, in the 90s, an Irish monk recorded in the Annals of Ulster that even a hundred boisterous, unending voices could not recount what all the Irish suffered in common, both men and women, laity and clergy, old and young, noble and ignoble, of hardship and injury and oppression in every house from these wrathful, foreign, purely pagan people. That's not a real good press clipping, but it kind of does, I think, illustrate uh, what was happening. But by the late 10th century, Vikings were more interested in founding royal dynasties and converting to Christianity than actually raiding and looting. Sure, they wanted to capture kingdoms and duchies and so on, but the raids, the conquests are different in character. And this was true in Ireland as well as other places. Now, it's, I think, interesting to note, too, that before the arrival of the Vikings at around 800, uh, there was not really a single town in Ireland. Uh, sure, village communities, but no hubs of commercial activity and so on. And these Viking raiders and settlers brought with them the rudiments of urbanization to Ireland at this time. And the great example, of course, is Dublin itself, which I believe is still the largest Viking site excavated in Europe. Um, is it still going on? I haven't been there for a while. The dig, the dig in Dublin, is it still on? Sorry, I'm trying to unmute. I don't think it still is going on. Uh, I'm not sure though. Yeah, I think it was finished. Well, that's unfortunate because they probably did about 10%. Yeah. Um, now it might be going on. You know, I left Dublin a yeah. long time ago. <laughs> um, but at any rate, um, you know, in Ireland, the Scandinavians hold on main ports such as Dublin. Uh, they were tenacious about this. They didn't want to give them up. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Irish stayed Irish and there was little permanent settlement inland and little change can be seen in Irish culture, Irish language, other than economics and kind of raw politics uh, at this time. Um, and in terms of Viking Dublin, it began really as just a, a kind of port base um, established somewhere around 840 or so. Uh, and within a generation, it really was a commercial center for uh, goods and so on from Scotland and England, the Isle of Man, Ireland itself, all over the place. And for the next hundred years or so, um, various kings kind of faded in and out and people tried to control um, the port itself. Um, and as a result, you know, there were always battles and skirmishes between Vikings and the Irish and so on. And sometimes Irish kings joined the Vikings to attack another Irish king. Um, and so, you know, warfare was pretty endemic. And so we have entering the scene, Citric Silkenbeard which probably is a, a kind of a nickname, meaning his beard was really scraggly because Vikings often did that with their nicknames. Uh, they were criticisms uh, or ironic criticisms rather than, you know, this guy having a really nice beard. But at any rate, uh, Citric was of Norse or origin, although he was uh, connected in a couple of different ways to Brian Baru through some family marriages and so on. But he was born in Dublin and Citric becomes king of Dublin and his reign lasted 46 years. He was a long reigning king. And uh, interestingly, he abdicated in 1036. But unlike Vikings of the Conquest, Citric was a Christian. And in fact, in 1028, the year of the founding of Dublin Cathedral, he went on pilgrimage to Rome 
And when he came back, he founded Christ Church in Dublin. It was originally a wooden building. It was rebuilt in stone during the uh, Angevin period in the 1180s. But uh, certainly that was a major event um, for the history of the church and history of Ireland. And it's additionally possible to trace the origins of territorial bishoprics based on the Roman model uh, to Citric's efforts as well in the early 11th century. Um, and what, one other little interesting note, uh, King Henry of England, whom we will see pop up, I think, in the next slide, uh, actually attended Christmas service at the cathedral in 1171, um, which is right around the time his troops were crushing everybody in the uh, Norman Angevin invasion of Ireland. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's interesting because um, here we have Henry receiving Holy Communion for the first time since he had, using this term loosely, ordered the murder of Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he does so in, um, in Christ Church. Um, so it was kind of for him like a photo opportunity you know, to take to take communion um, in this uh, this really important cathedral church. And as for Citric, um, who, as I mentioned, founded Christ Church, uh, he died as a peregrinus uh, at some unknown place, we think in 1042. But before he died in 1028, uh, he certainly did Ireland a good turn with Christ Church. So next slide, please. And here we have the quote Norman invasion of Ireland and Henry II. So it comes as no surprise to anybody that Ireland had been subjected to invasion after invasion before the time of Henry II but always seemed to have survived the onslaught with considerable damage oftentimes, but nevertheless survived. Um, and much like we see in the, the history of Imperial China, for example, uh, the Irish tended to absorb their conquerors who sometimes became more Irish than the Irish. Um, and even with Henry II, uh, the Irish would survive again, but the impact was long lasting for sure. And as I've implied, this was not truly a Norman invasion, but an Angevin one as Henry was as much French and Angevin as he was Norman. Uh, at the time for, uh, in fact, he held the French territories of Anjou, Maine, Aquitaine, Brittany. Um, in fact, he held more land in France than the King of France held. Um, he was a powerhouse and an empire builder. Um, and he always wanted more. So in 1154, right when he comes to the throne, he gets a papal bull, a, an official document from the English born Pope Hadrian IV, encouraging him to go to Ireland to do what? to check the torrent of wickedness, to reform evil manners, to sow the seeds of virtue among the Irish. And of course they were in sore need of all of that. Um, so the, uh, Adrian authorized um, the, uh, the King of England and all those other places to invade Ireland, to proclaim the truths of the Christian religion to a rude and ignorant people. Well, the die was cast here for the next couple of centuries with Rome's backing and a powerful invasion force. Well, the English did regard the Irish as barbarous and backward, and um, there was a lot of give and take and back and forth, um, but uh, King Henry II actually 
uh, allied himself with one of the um, one of the kings of Ireland, and Henry allowed the king to recruit mercenaries for his army uh, within his Angevin territories. So Dermot um, put together a force of Irish and foreigners with some Flemish mercenaries thrown in from Wales as well. So Henry's timing was influenced by several factors, including encouragement from the popes, uh, both Adrian and eventually Alexander, Pope Alexander III, who saw an opportunity to establish papal authority in Ireland, which was lacking. So in 1169, Henry sends an army over and two years later, he lands in Ireland himself, where as I mentioned, earlier, um, he spent some time in Dublin. And in late 1171, in the presence of Henry, the Irish clergy gathered at Cashel and proclaimed Henry's title to the sovereign dominion of Ireland. And all of them took an oath of fealty to him and to his successors, future kings. So Alexander, uh, the Pope, was thrilled um, that all of this happened. And um, ironically, um, the change was a, a, in some ways advantageous to the Irish church. Um, I say this because traditionally um, native chieftains uh, and kings were absolute masters over all of their followers, whether they be secular uh, or ecclesiastic. But according to the new order of things introduced by Henry, the Irish lords did not any longer have such control over uh, their clergy. And this was very much a sign of the times too. Uh, uh, the church was becoming more interested in the separation of church and state. And uh, this was uh, looked at as a good thing by many. And even after Henry's conquest and there was colonization that followed as well, um, the English community in Ireland was never really monolithic. I mean, in some areas around Dublin and relatively large villages like Kilkenny, Limerick, Cork, you know, Wexford, people spoke English, they used English law. They lived in a manner that was similar to that lived in England. Yet it took a number of centuries more before real political control of Ireland came to the English in the 16th and 17th centuries. So next slide, please. Yep, that's it. So Edward Bruce, the brother of Robert the Bruce and the Battle of Fart of 1318. It was hard to pick a good date uh, and event in the 13, uh, 1300s because there are so many of them, but this battle I think seemed important um, to me as I was ruminating over all this stuff. Um, and it's a very, the, the context is very complicated in terms of the, the military and political um, maneuverings and so on. But it really has to do not just with Ireland, but with Scotland and England as well. Robert the Bruce, one of the most renowned warriors of his generation and ruler of Scotland and successful leader of the first war of Scottish independence against England had designs on Ireland. He wanted to um, kind of institute a pan Gaelic greater Scotia uh, concept. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit about the kind of Asia for Asian slogan that came out of World War II out of Japan. Um, let's get all the Celts and people together um, and we can defeat the, you know, the English conquerors. It was that kind of thing. 
Um, so he tries to uh, kind of sell this, this notion and he does so in the context of alliances that uh, he establishes with some of the Irish families. Um, he of course saw himself as high king, however, um, which was not to the liking of most of the Irish. And before Robert journeyed to Ireland to, you know, kind of assert this, um, this notion, he sends his brother Edward, um, who in 1316 actually was crowned high king. It didn't last very long because of the battle that is the topic of, uh, of this date. Um, Initially, the Scot-Irish army um, fighting against the English seemed unstoppable. And um, they had great success in freeing a lot of Irish land from English hands. But the situation became complicated, not really um, of human cause, but a famine struck um, this put pressure on um, Bruce's army uh, to sustain itself. And so it began raiding and pillaging uh, various settlements uh, where the army was trudging. And it didn't matter whether they were English or Irish settlements, uh, which caused considerable difficulties. Um, but everything came to a head with the Battle of Fart in 1318. Edward Bruce, according to the Chronicle, seems to have been the architect of, of his own defeat uh, when he decided to engage a larger army of Anglo-Irish leaders and soldiers, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 soldiers without waiting for reinforcements from his brother, Robert the Bruce. And so um, he engaged in battle not far from Dundalk uh, on October 14th. Um, and um, when Edward's Irish allies, which were not all that numerous, but nevertheless substantial, uh, objected to his facing a larger army in battle, um, Edward responded by moving them to the rear of the battle so that his 2,000 Scots would face the enemy virtually alone. Well, needless to say, the army was overrun. It was a victory for the Anglo-Irish and Edward the Bruce uh, fell at the same time. And uh, this is a gruesome detail, but after his death, he was beheaded, his body was cut up into four parts and sent to the four quarters of Ireland uh, as just a nice symbolic gesture. Well, for the Scott King, Robert the Bruce, um, the whole venture was, was kind of a failure, but there was an upside for him. Um, as the English for a couple of hundred years ne were never again able to mount an attack against Scotland from Ireland. In other words, attacking the Western seaboard of Scotland. Um, and nor uh, in terms of the Irish advantage, the Scots never again posed a serious threat uh, to Ireland. So this was a crucial battle that really did change uh, the course of history. So one, two more slides. Um, this may seem a peculiar choice, uh, the uh, martyrdom of Dermot O'Hurley. But within the context of the Protestant revolt, in the 16th century, it does kind of make sense. At any rate, the Irish Catholic martyrs 
as I'm sure you are aware, were dozens of people who have been sanctified for dying for their Catholic faith, uh, really between 1537 and 1700 or thereabouts. Um, and what brought the Catholic martyrs uh, really to the fore of people's consciousness was the canonization of Oliver Plunkett. Um, is his head still on display? Anybody know? Yes. It is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Dragda, <up>. yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember. It was actually stolen recently and replaced. I, you know, I have a vague recollection of something to do with that, but yeah, it is still on display. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember being struck by it uh, quite, quite blatantly, in fact. Anyway, um, his, his canonization in 1975 brought a lot of this uh, back into scholarship. And one of the martyrs is Dermot O'Hurley, who was the Archbishop of Cashel. Uh, a highly educated man, uh, O'Hurley returned to Ireland after being appointed Archbishop of Cashel by Pope Gregory the 13th in 1581. And again, this was in the midst of the conflict between the newly formed Church of England and the Catholic Church. Um, O'Hurley never reached Cashel because as soon as he stepped foot um, on Irish soul at Carrick in the fall of 1583, he was imprisoned in Dublin Castle. And according to um, the correspondence between Dublin and London, Queen Elizabeth I, who was kind of a law and order ruler, uh, was reluctant to dispense with a fair trial under English common law, but um, some of her advisors changed her mind and she approved a military tribunal. So O'Hurley was tried in one day and sentenced to death that same day. Um, and despite extreme measures of torture, which I will spare you the grim details of that, um, he refused to embrace Protestantism. And so on the 20th of June, we think, of 1584, he was carried out um, to St. Stephen's Green and executed. And as, his, uh, as word of his ex execution spread, uh, O'Hurley was immediately revered as a martyr by Catholics throughout Europe. And this is the real significance of this event. It, it really magnified uh, what was happening in Ireland um, throughout the continent. And several accounts of his life and death were subsequently printed and reached a really wide audience. Uh, and ultimately in 1992 was beatified by John Paul um, and probably is in line to become another saint of the church. Well, following Catholic emancipation in the 19th century, um, you know, Ireland's um, Roman Catholic hierarchy began an investigation into his life uh, and death. And ironically, um, just as an aside, the, um, the, the best documentation were um, records and letters written by the men who tortured and executed him. So they kind of sowed the seeds of their own disaster, so to speak. But again, the, um, the significance um, is, I think, uh, fairly clear. Well, our last date for tonight is 1649. And some six months, give or take, after the English rump parliament executed King Charles I, Oliver Cromwell arrives in Dublin on the 15th of August as commander in chief of the parliamentary army. And on September 11th, his forces overwhelmed Drogheda. 
It was garrisoned by 3,000 English royalists. And those were guys who were supporting or had supported King Charles I. Um, and uh, a contingent of the Irish Catholic Confederate soldiers, all of whom were commanded by Arthur Ashton. After a week-long siege, Cromwell's forces breached the walls of the town. Ashton refused Cromwell's request that he surrender. And so the battle was close within the town itself. Cromwell, characteristically, orders that no quarter will be given. And so the majority of the garrison and pretty much all the Catholic priests were killed during the struggle. Many civilians also died in the attack. And Ashton himself was beaten to death by Cromwell's roundheads, his soldiers, uh, with his own wooden leg. A month later, Cromwell took West, uh, Wexford. New Ross surrendered very soon after that before Cromwell could order the massacre of that population. And so within a very short period of time, within three months, pretty much all resistance uh, faltered in Ireland. So brutal was this conquest. And um, if we want to take a look at this history by the numbers of Cromwell's four-year invasion and occupation, we find that there were anywhere from 15 to 20,000 battlefield casualties among the Irish, an estimated 200,000 to 600,000 civilian casualties related to the war itself, violence of the war, famine, disease. Uh, there was a recurrence of the bubonic plague at this time, but somewhere in the neighborhood of half a million died. And then on top of it, 50,000 Irish were deported as indentured servants and laborers. Um, again, a crushing defeat and um, I think it's kind of ironic um, that Cromwell's actions, he's probably turning over in his grave as I say this, but Cromwell's actions uh, and the memory of those events and the images still exist there. I mean, you still see these Cromwellian forts uh, and they're just incredibly oppressive. But these events, the memory, really, I think, helped the Irish obtain independence in 1921. So many dark days, but such a bright future. I mean, any people who can emerge from a thousand years of oppression and still raise a glass and salute one's comrades and friends, you know, really hit those party pieces when it's necessary. Um, those folks are, are destined to last a couple more millennia at least. And that is all I have to say. I think that's great. <laughs> I like that you end on a happy note after one of the saddest instances. <laughs> well, the happier yeah. note is going to be after I get off screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we'll all be on now. Um, so does anyone have any questions or comments? Or um, I'm, I'm monitoring Facebook as well. There's a few on there too. So if anyone has any questions or let me just stop sharing. I think actually um, you had a question about what did anyone have what they thought was a turning point in Irish history? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any ideas there? So you can unmute yourself and chime in. Hi, um, I was wondering why you uh, went with Citric Silkbeard and not Brian Boru, who let's just say he's got bigger name recognition. Well, that's for sure. 
Um, the, um, the, the event that I was emphasizing, however, was the foundation of the cathedral. Okay. And, that, and that was Citrix business. Um, it's, it's, it's probably my, my bias for church history um, rather than the other stuff. But uh, yeah, that's, what, that's why I chose Citrix. That's good. That's a good point, though. It's, it's probably hard to, you know, narrow it down to ten because there are such kind of famous personalities and and names, and you know, yeah. I mean, this is not my field at all. But um, growing up, you know, there's certain battles that are famous in Kerry that mightn't have been heard of every place else, or you know, that kind of thing. Um, right. yes, Jeffrey, it is. We recorded it, so it'll be kind of um archived on Facebook, you know, so we're streaming, streaming it live, but then as soon as we finish, it'll kind of replay itself on Facebook. So you'll catch it there. And I'm able to share that onto our YouTube page if anybody doesn't have Facebook. I just, sorry, that was a little question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, anyone else have anything? Yeah, we're just glad we were able to have you back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad I survived the year, actually. Yeah, I think we all are in one way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Can I ask so, another question? I just don't, sure, I don't please, Thomas. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, early on the difference between the, I'll call it the Celtic Church and the Roman Church. And yeah. I guess part of it was the uh, Easter calendar, and part of it was bishops versus monks. But, yeah. Was there any real, what I'll call, theological difference? Like, I know he technically wasn't Irish, but Pelagius was a British Celt, and he had a big yeah. feud with St. Augustine. Were the Irish particularly of the Pelagian um, mindset? or Not really. I mean, um, you know, a lot of those big guns from late antiquity, like Augustine and and his, his lot, um, those texts were available to the Irish and they studied them. Um, mm -hmm. One could suggest that, uh, you know, uh, the Irish were a little fonder of Neoplatonists like Plotinus um, and the theologians that kind of followed those guys. Um, virtually no one knew Aristotle. So that, that only comes up in the 13th century. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that uh, the, the kind of standard approach wouldn't, I mean, theologically uh, among the Irish, wouldn't have upset, um, the, you know, the, Ro the Roman clerics. Uh, beyond a couple of, you know, these oddities, important ones, but like Easter or, you know, like the tonsor, for example. I mean, either I can't bend the that haircut. far, but I've got a tonsor right here. Um, it's natural. I didn't do it on purpose. But, um, you know, this is Roman and then this would be Irish and, you know, and that's significant. At least it was then. I mean, it might seem silly now, but um, you know, these were important issues. But beyond the, that kind of thing, um, you know, the Trinity's intact, and you know that sort of thing. Thank you. Yep. So we had a question on Facebook from Linda: um, How many of these Irish church histories have you done, and are they posted on your Facebook page? I answered as the museum, you know, we don't have any <laughs> of these done really. We, we do have a, um, a presentation at the moment or an exhibition at the moment about um, kind of early Christianity and then the kind of um, Celtic revival, you know, and all of this, the art. We have a, a thing about um, the, some of the books, the books of Doro and Kells, but um, we could probably, you know, start to do some of them. And I don't know, Mark, if you have a like a history page that you share stuff on or no yeah <laughs> and no plans to do one <laughs> no, I'm, i mean you know that i love irish history and i've mm -hmm. done some studying uh taught it a couple of times at university 
Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm an Anglo-Saxon historian. Okay. And not a practicing one at this point. Well, that's good. <laughs> Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> Yeah. Can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, I want to thank Fiona. Uh, hi, Fiona. I, I got an email later the, today that I just stumbled upon. I was checking my emails. And this is the first time I've, I've, I've been here and I'm very interested and intrigued. So I want to know how can I sign up for the next conversation or the next presentation? Okay. Sure. And, and, you know, the differences. Uh, so I, I was only here for the last two slides, but. Uh, I find this very fascinating. I love church history and I love the history of Ireland. All my family's from there, but you know, um, so I'm very interested in becoming more engaged and involved in, in these uh, presentations. Great. Uh, how do I sign up is the big question. And thank yeah. you, Fiona. Thank no you. Problem. So we do about 10, you know, talks a month on different topics. You know, this is one of the earliest things we've ever done. If you yeah. don't have Facebook, we our website is www.irish-us.org. I'm going to write it in the, in the, in the chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do have Facebook. I do. Oh, good. And so you'll find us on Facebook. We do a kind of a on this day. Oh, I left out a W. <laughs> we, we do a, an on this day post every day on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And then, as I say, we do about eight to 10 talks and or music, you know, presentations a month. Um, and we'd love to have you, you know, we, we take members, but we offer these talks, you know, free to the public. So for instance, on Monday, um, we're giving, I'm giving a talk about the Irish War of Independence. We've been doing this for over a year because we're marking, you know, each month as it goes by in the War of Independence, the Black and Tan War. And then on yeah. Wednesday, we're having, oh, Wednesday. I think it's another author from Washington State. He's he's written three books about like a family history of immigrants that came over in the famine and then he traces their family. Um, but you know, we have Larry Kerwin coming at the end of the month to talk about he wrote a novel about 9-11 and Irish American cops in Rockaway. We have um an Irish 1916. We have a couple of 1916 things coming up with um he was the state historian the military state historian um bob mulligan that'll be like maybe march 26th or something or april we're in a whole no month so april 26th so yeah everything is posted on either our website or our facebook page oh, and if you don't email us like we'll send you the zoom link you know through email yeah. both you can catch us live on facebook too right. mm -hmm. oh thank i have to thank my friend fiona because yeah thank you fiona i'm very happy to have been invited by you very good happy. good yeah well we you know we send a newsletter every month to members um so just register for that you know and, and you'll I get will. that mm -hmm. I, will. Good, good. I will what about the great irish women we had a ton of them in march mm. so we did um, uh, actually same sex uh, women, but they will all be archived on our Facebook page. So you can go back okay. exactly yeah Right. So we did um, fantastic presentations about 1916 women um, who were same sex. We did Irish women, uh, Irish American women uh, um, activists with Dr. Tara right. McCarthy from Wisconsin. So yeah, you you know oh, you missed a ton, but they're right. all there. <laughs> right. We'll use this at our girls' school too, just so you know. Who who did? Yeah. We will be you will uh, will be the only oh, thought do. Is yeah, with, that'd be great. in our girls' school that I I am uh, part of the administration of. Good, good. This is just. You know, beyond just the Irish, it's such a rich history. Yeah. So many of us here in, in the United States share that common ancestry with so many people from Ireland, you know. Exactly, yeah, uh, yeah. And and it's important too, because part of the church's history is so steeped, you know, in, in Irish traditions. And, you know, mm -hmm. the Irish, we believe, saved education and lots of things too. And mm -hmm. we don't have enough of that story being shared uh, about mm -hmm. the goodness and the greatness of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the people of Ireland. And I, yeah, I thought you, so you missed a little bit at the start of Mark's talk where he talks about the transition from, you know, sort of Celtic and pagan yep. and then into the Roman right. and, and where yes. the Irish are involved. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yes. So no, I bet you, it was. Um, there's a ton of stuff that you can. I'm, I'm going to go look and trust me. Yeah, good, good. I am. I definitely am. So okay. thank you, Fiona, for sharing that. And uh, yeah. anyone else have anything? I'm looking on Facebook too, but they're all quiet there. I think people are saying thank you and wonderful event but i think there's no more questions on facebook does anyone else here have a question judy no. and Chuck, how are you long time no see um I'm, I'm catching people that i see you know <laughs> 
so no this was great i think um thank you so much we might have to have you come back and do the next you know five or six hundred years <laughs> five or six hundred years at a time is okay yeah yeah that, well exactly now that you've gone into that level of detail with this early stuff uh, we certainly couldn't have pushed it out you know <laughs> that's right that's right that's Thank right God. That's great. Thank you so much. Not at all. We're delighted. You know, it has kept us all sane, I think. You know, as I say, this was rescheduled from last March. Uh, and so I, I don't know. Certainly we didn't think we'd be here this long, you know, still doing Zoom. But it right. has helped us to open up and reach a wider audience too. You know, with people joining right. us that are not in Albany. And right. um, so it's a nice way to stay connected when right. we're all, you know, on our homes <laughs> or in our homes on our own. So Dr. Stack. Mm -hmm. Have you written a book? Uh, well, I have, uh, you know, technically. It wasn't published, probably. Uh, my dissertation know, it's about Irish very, and German. Your, your name is very familiar to me. Oh, there's tons of stacks. I used to work at Fordham University, so that ah, might there you have go. been... There it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's it. There yeah, you go. <laughs> good. So, yeah, I was involved at the Institute of Irish Studies down there for ah, nine years. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, <laughs> great. A lot of my friends teach at Fordham. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jerry, do you know Jerry Cataro? A little bit, yeah. Yes, Jerry. Oh. Yeah, definitely. And oh, um, uh, Dr. Zenner, she works in the theology department. Okay, Dr. I was based obviously out of history, but we did a lot with the current institute, and you know, yeah. Oh, the institute, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. My friend Christiana Christie, Dr. Richie Carter was there too. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh! See, and here we are with Small today. Albany, and now the Small World down at Fordham too. That is great. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So well, there you go. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and uh, great to see you. And, Hi, Ella. Um, I'll talk to we'll, It looks like Ella, though. Bye-bye. Yeah, Fiona's there, too. And we'll we'll talk next week. We're back on on Monday. Oh, And wonderful. thank you, Dr. Meyer. This was thank really brilliant. So and do, you know, start preparing your next 500 years. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and before a thank year you. goes by, we'll have you yeah. back. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you are going to have to get me another bottle to. Okay. Yeah, if you want to be in charge of the, the Irish tears. <laughs> yeah. Empire tears. doesn't have it. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, Jameson will have to do. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thank Good night. you. Take care. Stay Bye. safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. That was grand. <laughs>